Okay, so now we're going to understand the different types of devotees and how to associate. Translation. One should mentally honor the devotee who chants the holy name of Lord Krishna. One should offer humble obeisances to the devotee who has undergone spiritual initiation, diksha, and is engaged in worshiping the deity. And one should associate with and faithfully serve that pure devotee who is advanced in undeviated devotional service and whose heart is completely devoid of the propensity to criticize others. Mm -hmm. So that's the translation. The three kinds of devotees are mentioned here. The neophyte, the middle stage, and the uh, uttama, or the higher stage. These three are categories as kanista, or neophyte devotee. Sometimes we say prakrita bhakta, or um, materialistic devotee, Madhyama Adhikari, middle devotee, preacher, and Uttama Adhikari, he is the 100% pure devotee who is completely purified and is on the highest platform of spiritual realization. So, <clears throat> so this verse describes these three and the characteristics and qualities of each of them, like that. So this is, um, well, the thing is, we should um, understand how to relate to each of these three. And we should also know what is our position within these three categories like that. The Kanista Adhikari, or is it considered to be the, the per person who was on the beginning stage of bhakti, or sometimes it's described on the lowest stage of bhakti, like that does not understand uh, the, the all-pervading nature of the Supreme. Example is, he can't see God within and without. He can only see God in the deity. <laughs> That's all. He sees things separately. He sees God and he sees his energy as two different complete things. He sees this is material, God is there in the deity. He appreciates the spiritual master, but doesn't know how to behave with other devotees. He's proud of his own worship, and he thinks he's more advanced than others. <laughs> I remember when we first joined the Hare Krishna movement, we used to call it pure devotee syndrome, PDS afflicted with this disease, thinking, I've been in Krishna consciousness one year, I got it. <laughs> I'm fixed. Others don't really know how advanced I am. <laughs> and he thinks, you know, yeah, the other devotees, they're okay, but usually they just get in my way. <laughs> and the deity, it's everything, and the spiritual master is everything, and the, and the karmis, they're just rotten, materialist, poo. We don't care about them. <laughs> he's not interested in preaching. He just thinks he's the best. <laughs> he finds the qualities of the materialists attractive. And sometimes he sees the devotees as being somewhat, you know, dysfunctional. <laughs> His mind is not fixed. He... If he, ha he has a chance to elevate himself if he gazes in deity worship. But he worshiped the deity, but he cannot understand that that same deity that he's worshiping on the altar is in the heart of all living beings. Therefore, he, is a, he sees things in a very limited or materialistic way. This is called neophyte. Sometimes we say those who like to fight. <laughs> Devotees who argue with each other, that's a neophyte. Devotees don't argue or fight. You can't find people on the second or third class, first class platform, they're not interested in argument and fighting. They're interested in serving and working together in devotional service. They avoid that kind of conflict because it interferes with their devotional service. They tolerate it or distance themselves from that and engage in devotional service. A neophyte likes to argue likes to fight. 
because he thinks he's the best. Okay. So he's affected by karma, and he is interested in sense gratification. He's also affected by impersonalism and Mayavadi ideas, and therefore he thinks that those, some of those philosophies have some value. He takes karma and Mayavad, or what we say, Gyan principles, and mixes them in with bhakti. He sees these also on the same level like that. So this is called neophyte, and Prabhupada in one purport in the Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, 21st chapter, 31st verse, describes that one should get off that platform. There's no real progress there. One has to get away from the neophyte platform because one cannot function, perform devotional service steady and eventually if one stays on that platform, one will leave Krishna consciousness. They call materialist bhakta or prakriti. They have a tendency to be envious of other devotees. Sometimes they become envious of those who are more advanced than them, thinking that, that those persons are simply, you know, proud. That's all. So this is a materialistic devotee, and this is called the neophyte stage, the lowest stage. You can read more about that qualities from verse 11, Canto 11, verse, verse 47 in chapter 2 of Canto 11. 11 to 47, the lowest stage. So um, they worship the deity. They don't behave very well with other devotees. They're not really interested in preaching, and their faith, faith is very soft and unsteady, and they're easily, uh, they're easily uh, tripped up, and they're always making mistakes. Yet they think differently. <laughs> so, so um, this was, I don't see it so much now, but it was very common when we, our movement first started, that there was so much power and energy and facility when Prabhupada was personally present that devotees were just swept away in it. But still, they still had their material tendencies and didn't be able to see them and thinking they were advanced devotees like that. And so Prabhupada had to deal with a lot of that. <laughs> so that's called Kanista, Prakriti Bhakta, a neophyte devotee. Um, we don't find fault with that, but we at the same time we understand that that person must raise themselves up and how they do it by following the rules and regulations of worship in the form of deities like that. Usually we engage them in deity worship and that way they become purified of that tendency and start to understand the higher principles of devotional service like that. So that's the Kanista Adhikari. Any questions on Kanista <laughs> or Neophyte? Yes. That means they're moving towards the Madhyam platform. They're still afflict afflicted by, both, by the Kanista tendencies, but they're moving forward. It's a gradual process. <laughs> But the main quality of a kanista is, you know, he thinks he's advanced. <laughs> and he thinks everyone else is okay. Some are more advanced than me, but not too many. <laughs> right, Krishna. I'm laughing because I, I usually remember I used to think like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You can't stay there because you're, it's offensive. It can be an offensive platform. A canista's tendency has envy towards, towards others, still afflicted by the, the principle of envy. You see, Prabhupada says, if you don't preach, you will become envious. He told that to Jamuna. I was reading Jamuna's diary. He says, if you don't take up the process of preaching to others, you will be envious. It's just the nature of the conditioned souls. Unless we give what we receive, we will not be able to appreciate others and be called, we'll be envious of others. It's just natural. 
And he said that twice in two different occasions. It's in writing also. So Prabhupada makes that point. If you don't preach, see the second clad platform or the Madhiman platform is the platform of preaching where one discriminates between the devotees and the non-devotees and we'll get into their characteristics in a few minutes but staying on the neoflat platform means that one is only interested in their own spiritual advancement that's the main main thing it's me i am the center my advancement is the most important thing I like that that's neophyte like that mm -hmm. Therefore, they don't see any need for preaching or they don't feel any compulsion to take up that, that preaching mood. Yes. Chief? I'll be, you can go next after Chief. Okay. You said that um, the best way to raise oneself on this platform is to preach. But in order to protect one, one uh, No, they have to come to that stage where preaching becomes their activity. The best way to get out of that stage is perform duty worship. And then they start developing Brahminical tendencies through the process of deity worship like that. Right, it says here, pliable, yeah. By association, yeah. If they associate with more advanced devotees in the mood of serving those are devotees, then gradually they'll they'll make advancement like that. It mentions here. And gradually they'll start to understand the real mentality of devotional service and start to gradually advance like that. Through association and through worshiping the Lord in the temple like that, following the rules and regulations carefully like that. It purifies the heart, and then they start seeing or understanding that that same deity that I'm worshiping is in everybody's heart. <laughs> That's the understanding. When you come to the second class platform, then you, you're fixed in the understanding that Krishna is everywhere within the energy. He's there in the form of the deity. But most important, he's in the heart of the, every living entity. Therefore, then you start to treat each living entity accordingly, like that, based on that principle of seeing Krishna in the heart, or understanding Krishna's presence in the heart of all living entities. <laughs> That's the preaching platform. Beatrice? <laughs> um, say again? Principles of Gyan is that one starts to cultivate knowledge for the sake of knowledge. But now, in other words, one collects knowledge or thinks that knowledge is actually the goal. That's a principle. A Gyani is a one. Gyan means one who's fixed in knowledge. But the Gyanis use knowledge simply to detach themselves from material activities and, and just focus themselves on being uh, what we say fixed in the impersonal understanding of God. <laughs> you see without the service attitude these Gyan principles are still strong. One has to develop the sense of service to the Lord, to the spiritual master and to the Vaishnavas and to people in general. So devotee relates to four types of people. They serve each of these four categories in the mood in different ways, but each of the moods or each of the ways is through serving them. Serving the Vaishnavas by becoming friends with the Vaishnavas and inspiring them in their own devotional service, sharing Krishna consciousness, serving the Lord by offering our devotion and love to the Lord. Serving the spiritual master by following carefully his instructions. Serving the non-devotees by preaching Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the mood of service is there on that platform. Mm -hmm. So the Gyan principle is, I'm advanced because I have scriptural knowledge. They might read the books and just collect all kinds of knowledge. Also can recite verses. 
There was one story where, it's, this is somewhat related, where uh, one devotee, he just came into the movement, he's been always around for a little while, he learned the whole Bhagavad Gita by heart. The whole Bhagavad Gita, all the verses by heart. 700 verses. So the, it was impressive to the other devotees. So they brought him to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was there, and they introduced him, and they said, Prabhupada, this devotee knows the whole Bhagavad Gita by heart. He can recite all the verses. Prabhupada didn't even look at him and says, is there any service he can do? <laughs> That's all. Give him some service to do, and then he could be more useful. So the point was, he was proud of that knowledge. So, you know, the Gyan principle is you collect knowledge and you become proud of it. You think you know so much. You can recite verses, you can, you know, chant mantras. Like that. So, but they don't understand the goal of the knowledge. Is The goal of the knowledge is not a knowledge itself. But the goal of the knowledge is to understand that knowledge by applying it in the practical application of service to the Lord, devotees, to people in general like that. That's the purpose of the knowledge. So that's a Gyan principle. And Mayavad principle is that um, I'm chanting the holy names of the Lord, but beyond the chanting of the holy name there is you know, God in his unmanifested form. He's manifested himself in the holy name, but higher than that is his un impersonal aspect of him. And that comes by not understanding the principle of bhakti, by not engaging in devotional service with knowledge. As Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu was saying, you should understand why you're doing, uh, how to do what you're doing and why you're doing. This should be understanding, why am I doing this? What is my purpose? My purpose is to please the Lord and to become purified in Krishna consciousness. There's a purpose behind everything we do. That way, as, as Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu pointed out, we'll avoid those things that are contrary to these principles. But a neophyte, or can he'll mix in, you know, these uh, the different Mayavad concepts. It's very prominent within our Indian congregations, especially in Western countries like America or London, you know, they'll, any sadhu that comes in, ah, oh, Maharaj, <laughs> you know, the, the tendency is to honor all sadhus. But Prabhupada talks about, you know, you know, when he was first, before he was first introduced to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, his friend Narendra Nakmulik said, Abai! Come, we'll meet a nice sadhu. Prabhupada said, I saw so many of these sadhus. Because you know. <laughs> when he grew up in his family, his father was very inclined to honoring any holy man that came in. He said, there was no, no less than three or four holy men living at my father's home at a time. And he would supply food. He would give them hashish to smoke because that's what you, they smoke hashish also. Prabhupada talks about that. You know, we're just honoring all sadhus and not seeing any discrimination. Even this is, there is sadhu. A sadhu is one who cuts away material life. A sadhu is not someone who speaks nicely philosophy, dresses in a certain way, smiles every time you look at him, and, and has his thing ready to collect as much money as you're ready to give him. That's, that's not a sadhu. <laughs> And somebody else. The point is, is that, and Prabhupada was asked by one person, Swamiji, we have so many holy men, sadhus, saints in India, but we have so many problems. Prabhupada's answer. The problem is, you don't know who a sadhu is. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. So one has to understand. Therefore, that's one of the tendencies in our society is people don't, don't discriminate between different types of sadhus. Well, who is a real sadhu and who is someone who is just practicing yoga 
or he has some um, uh, tendencies towards devotion, but it's not worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead like that. Yeah. So one has to make that discrimination. Yes, Prabhu? Uh. Sometimes we see that uh, sometimes preachers they become proud or even fall down. Yeah. So uh, it seems like a contradiction because Madhya Kari he shouldn't be puffed up for the No, he couldn't. But you shouldn't see anybody else as puffed up. <laughs> if you see other people as puffed up, that means that's not good. <laughs> You can't, we can't really tell if a person is puffed up or not. You can tell simply by the way they conduct themselves in the day-to-day -day life, how they act and interact with others. Then you can understand what if they're proud or not. I mean, Prabhupada would speak so strongly, he would shake the room. And sometimes people will think, he's so proud, he's just condemning everybody. And Prabhupada said, no. I'm not condemning everybody. I'm just telling you what Krishna says. You're a fool. <laughs> Krishna says, Avajanti mam mudha, manusim tanam aspartam, param bhava majanata, mama bhuta maheshvara. Fools deride me when I come in this human form. So Prabhupada was so strong, and I got that question so many times. Your spiritual master, he just condemns everything. And Prabhupada said, yes, they're worth condemning. <laughs> He was giving us the point right there. He wasn't going to compromise just to patronize. And, and, and people were affected by that. You know, people who couldn't understand where he was coming from. He was coming from the platform of discriminating between this is bhakti and this looks like bhakti, but it's not. <laughs> The pure devotee can see something that is not, that appears to be. And therefore, Prabhupada Stro spoke very strongly. So people say, yeah, he, your spiritual master was proud. <laughs> so speaking strongly doesn't mean make you proud. Speaking strongly is a feature of service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But speaking strongly means to apply that according to time, place, and circumstance. So, not that speaking strongly is used always in every case, no. One has to learn to speak effectively, and strong preaching is part of effective preaching. So, a person who may speak like that may look like they're very proud. Like that. But how do you understand they're proud or not? How they deal with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Then you can understand whether that person is actually proud or not. That's the real understanding. How they deal with everyone. And when they get up and speak, and speak very strongly, it's not an indication of pride. It could be. It could be. But not, that's not the way to judge. Better not to judge others. If, we, if we're always just focusing on ourselves, we'll be able to see things more clearly. And as it says here, the highest platform is not to find fault with others. A, pro, a preacher will have to find fault with a person's activity, but not the person. He'll devoid the person from the activity and condemn the activity and not the person. Prabhupada never hardly ever condemned the person. Only a few times he did when persons were condemning us, and Prabhupada would turn it around and speak about him and show his disqualifications for speaking like that. But Prabhupada would always speak strongly about not so much the person, but about the material tendencies or the pretentiousness of a person who's practicing spiritual life and it claims to be advanced like that. Uh, that's why Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra is, what is, what is it? Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine. And Prabhupada's, you know, he shook up a lot of... There was a, there was a survey that was taken 
on categorizing various types of spiritual leaders in the history of the world. And it was one category where those saints that shook up people, and Prabhupada was in that category, <laughs> shake things up. Don't let everybody stay complacent. He spoke strongly to wake people up from their idea of material, you know, happiness, material tendencies like that. So it looks like pride, doesn't it? It'll look like pride. Yeah? <laughs> but it's not. It's actually compassion. But it's like a doctor knows sometimes, you know, I just can't give a medicine. This person has to go for an operation. <laughs> Yeah, the medicine's not going to cure the, the person. This, is, this requires some surgery. <laughs> so some surgery is necessary in certain cases to um, cure the patient from a particular type of material disease. <laughs> and Prabhupada wanted to teach what is, as Bhutta Bhavana was saying, the different Pandavas. We're seeing so many things, but Arjuna was only seeing the target, although everything else was around there. Prabhupada only saw that if you're not Krishna conscious, you're going to suffer. There's no in-between like that. Haribo. <laughs> so what can we say like that? But if a person unnecessarily finds fault with others through the process of preaching, then they may also commit offenses. And then, then they may also fall down. <laughs> so a person can fall down by committing offenses or being uh, thinking that I know so much. <laughs> Krishna says, Sarvasita hum riddhisani visto matat smitr agyanam apohanancha I give you knowledge, I give you remembrance, I give you forgetfulness. A devotee knows that I can't remember anything unless Krishna allows it. I can't forget anything unless Krishna allows it. I can't do anything unless Krishna gives me the, the, the potency. That's the consciousness that keeps one fixed in devotional service. Not so much the external activity. A person is seen, understood by his uh, dependence on Krishna in every, in each and every situation like that. Like that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, we have a few hands. Uh, Savitri Mataji and then uh, Prem Bhutti after that. <laughs> Uh-huh. Prabhupada taught us that we should try to preach to others, but if people are not receptive, then we should not waste time with them. <laughs> now here's another thing. We'll find that on the, the quality of an Uttama Arikari. An Uttama Arikari or a preacher, no, I'm sorry, a Madhyam preacher may discriminate between who should get the mercy and who should not. And others will say, well, why are you being discriminating? Why isn't he, why are you giving the mercy to everybody? But a preacher will understand this person cannot accept the mercy. And therefore, why waste time <laughs> like that? Why waste time? So in that case, you know, we try to offer Krishna consciousness and to 
everyone we come in contact with in one form or another. But if someone is a mimical, if you continue to push, they become more mimical, and that causes them more and more suffering. Because then they become offensive and blasphemous. Therefore, one of the qualities of a Madhyama Arikari is he, he ignores those who are against Krishna consciousness. Don't waste your time. There are so many people to preach to <laughs> who are eager for it. And why waste time and beat your head against the wall of someone who just doesn't want to change? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Any disagreements? I mean, I'm open for disagreement. <laughs>